Yesterday we have finished reading the introduction to the first chapter. Today we are finally going to read the actual sota itself instead of just the explanation. I'm going to begin to read the human condition. Section one, old age, illness and death. Point one, aging and death at Sawati. King Pasinadi of Kosala said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, is anyone who is born free from aging and death? Great King, no one who is born is free from aging and death. Even those affluent Katiyas, rich with great wealth and property, with abundant gold and silver, abundant treasures, and commodities, abundant wealth and gear and grain, because they have been born, are not free from aging and death. Even those affluent Brahmins, affluent householders, rich with abundant wealth and grain, because they have been born, are not free from aging and death. Even those monks who are Arahants, because they have been born, are not free. Okay, whose stains are destroyed, who have lived their holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached their own goal, utterly destroyed the fetters of existence, and are completely liberated through final knowledge. Even for them, this body is still subject to breaking up, subject to being laid down. The beautiful chariots of kings wear out. This body too undergoes decay. But the Dharma of the good does not decay. So the good proclaim along with the good. It's from Samyutta Nikaya 3. Yeah, 3.3. Okay, let's take a look at the footnotes here. Number one, King Pasenadi was the ruler of the state of Kosala, whose capital was Sawati. Jetawana, the grove of Prince Jeta, was also known as Anatapindika's Park because it was purchased for the Buddha by the wealthy philanthropist Anatapindika. The Nikayas depict Pasenadi as one of the Buddha's most devoted lay followers, though they never show him as attaining any stage of realization. An entire chapter of the Samyutta Nikaya, the Kosala Samyutta, chapter three, records his conversations with the Buddha. So this would not give the background of the Sutta. So Anathapinika purchased the whole park <laughs> for the Buddha. Call it Anathapinika's park. And then footnotes number two. Hmm. Yeah, this is also an important distinction. When speaking of the Arahant, the Buddha does not describe his destiny as aging and death but as a mere breaking up and discarding of the body. Why? This is because the Arahant, being free from all notions of eye and mind, does not conceive the decay and dissolution of the body as the aging and death of an eye. Now, if you notice all the previous sentences, says, are not free from aging and death. But for Arahants, you notice this line. Even for them, this body is subject to breaking up, subject to being laid down. The wording here is different. Why? The footnote says because for Arahans, they don't have the concept of I anymore. They don't have, they are free from the notions of I and mind, the concept of self. Okay. 
Uh, let's take a look at this word, affluent. Affluent here means having a great deal of money, wealthy. Okay, any questions for this sutta? Any difficult words? Any difficult words you would like to be defined? If not, let's continue reading the next one. Sister Sai Kyang. Okay. Point number two, the simile of the mountain. At Savati, in the middle of the day, King Pasanadi of Kosala approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, and sat down to one side. The Blessed One then asked him, Now, where are you coming from, great king, in the middle of the day? Just now, Venerable Sir, I have been engaged in those affairs of kingship typical for kings who are intoxicated with the intoxication of so sovereignty, who are obsessed by greed for sensual pleasures, who have attained stable control in their country and who rule having conquered a great sphere of territory on earth. What do you think, great king? Suppose a man would come to you from the east, one who is trustworthy and reliable, and would tell you, for sure, great king, you should know this. I am coming from the east, and there I saw a great mountain high as the clouds coming this way, crushing all living beings. Do whatever you think should be done, great king. Then a second man would come to you from the west, a third man from the north, and a fourth man from the south. One who is trustworthy and reliable, and would tell you, for sure, great king, you should know this. I am coming from the south, and there I saw a great mountain high as the clouds coming this way crushing all living beings. Do whatever you think should be done, great king. If, great king, such a great peril should arise, such a terrible destruction of human life, the human state being so difficult to obtain, what should be done? If, okay, thank you. Thanks, thank you. Okay, so this paragraph started with the king asking the Buddha a question. And the Buddha asked him, No, oh, where are you coming from, great king, in the middle of the day? And the Buddha, eh, no, not the Buddha, the king said, I have been engaged in those affairs of kingship, typical for kings. Let me highlight this. Who are intoxicated with the intoxication of sovereignty. Okay, let's highlight this. Okay, what is sovereignty? Let's define here. Supreme power or authority. Yeah, the first definition, I think the most appropriate. The second one, the authority of a state to govern itself or another state. The third definition, a self-governing state. So the king is intoxicated with power, obsessed with greed for sensual pleasures. Who have attained stable control in their country, this one, and who rule having conquered a great sphere of territory on earth. Yeah, mm. uh, this one, even in the Buddha's time, is already common. When someone is in power, they will be addicted to that power, reflected by this line. Who are intoxicated with the intoxication of sovereignty? Then the Buddha replied, suppose, what do you think? The Buddha asked the king a question. What do you think? If a man comes from you from the east, and then a second man from the west, third man from the north, 
fourth man from the south. Yeah. And then he's trustworthy and reliable. We can rely on his words. They are informing the king, a great mountain, high as the clouds, coming this way, crossing everyone, crossing all living beings. Then they say, do whatever you think should be done, great king. This is one of the skillful way that the Buddha usually does. He does not only expound the Dharma directly, but he invites a conversation. He asks questions and then let the other person to think about it. So the question that the Buddha asks, if great king such a great peril should arise, such a terrible destruction of human life, and the human state is so difficult to obtain, he asks the king, what should be done? Let's continue reading. Sister Bidi. If Bengal serves, such a great peril should arise, such a terrible destruction of human life, the human state being so difficult to obtain, what else should be done but to live by the Dharma, to live righteously and to do wholesome and meritorious deeds? I inform you, great king, I announce to you, great king, aging and death are rolling in on you. When aging and death are rolling in on you, great king, what should be done? As aging and death are rolling in on me, venerable sir, what else should be done but to live by the Dharma, to live righteously, and to do wholesome and meritorious deeds? Thanks, Sister Billy. Thank you. Let's see, huh? Okay, now after giving a simile, then the Buddha starts to point to the, yeah, points the king towards the Dharma. Yeah. And this line is actually not said by the Buddha. If you notice that this line, this whole line, is actually replied by the king himself. So when the Buddha asks the question, he gets the king to answer according to the Dharma. This is, I think, one of the skillful way that from the Buddha that I, I also find admir admirable. Then the Buddha continues, I inform you, great king, I announce to you, great king, aging and death are rolling in on you. When aging and death are rolling in on you, great king, what should be done? Uh, initially, this one is using the simile, such a great peril to arise, and the mountain simile. Now, the Buddha finally replaced that simile, the mountain simile, with aging and death. If aging and death are rolling in on me, Venerable Sir, what else should be done but to live by the Dharma? to live righteously and to do wholesome and meritorious deeds. Okay, next paragraph, Sister Aikin, would you like to read? Okay. Venerable Sir, kings intoxicated with the intoxication of sovereign, so, sovereignty, obsessed by greed for sensual pleasures, who have attained constant stable control in their country and rule over a great sphere of territory, conquered by means of elephant battles, cavalry battles, chariot battles, and infantry battles. But there is no hope of victory by such battles, no chance of success when aging and death are rolling in. In this royal court, Venerable Sir, there are counselors who, when the enemies arrive, are capable of dividing them by subterfuge, but there is no hope of victory by subterfuge. No chance of success when aging and death are rolling in. In this royal court, venerable sir, there exists abundant 
bullion and gold stored in vaults and loaves. And with such wealth, we are capable of mollifying the enemies when they come, but there is no hope of victory. By wealth, no chance of success. So when aging and death are rolling in, as aging and death are rolling in on me, venerable sir, what else should I do but live by the Dharma, live righteously and do wholesome and meritorious deeds? Thanks, Sister Hakim. Okay, so this paragraph is like the whole, the Buddha links the whole thing and then expound it to the king. It started, started off with the premise, kings intoxicated with the intoxicated sin of sovereignty. Yeah, all these are, uh, yeah, all these lines is the very first lines that the king told the Buddha. So the Buddha links them back, like giving a summary to the king. <laughs> I thought this is sorry. I thought this is still said by the king. Because the king will uh, express himself to say the Buddha as venerable, sir, right? No, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for pointing that out, Sekiang. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. This is the king addressed the Buddha as venerable, sir. So the king expound his understanding on his own, yeah, which is also a good thing, so that it comes from the king itself. Hmm. So the king relates to his experience that by means of elephant battles, cavalry battles, chariot battles, infantry battles, he can obtain such things, but when aging and death are rolling in, there is no hope for victory. The king realized. And then the next one in this royal court, Venerable Sir, there are counselors like a strategist who, when the enemies arrive, are capable of dividing them by subterfuge. And again, when aging and death are rolling in, there's no hope of victory by subterfuge. So what does subterfuge mean? Let's define here. Deceit used in order to achieve one's goal. And so it's like uh, having a strategy so that they can fool the enemy. The next one, the king relates with his treasures and wealth. Abundant bullion and gold stored in faults and loss. When the enemy comes, they can mollify the enemy. Let's define mollify. Appears the anger or anxiety of someone. Yeah. Reduce the anger of enemy. This is what he usually does. But he also mentioned again, when aging and death are rolling in, there's no hope of victory. No chance of success. And then he concludes again, as aging and death are rolling in, we should leave the Dharma by the Dharma, live righteously and do wholesome and meritorious deed. The Sutta concludes by the Buddha. So it is, great king, so it is, great king. As aging and death are rolling in on you, what else should you do but live by the Dharma, live righteously and do wholesome and meritorious deeds? Let me highlight this. Okay, and the rest is uh, verses by the Buddha. We will continue reading this tomorrow. Any questions or comments? If not, let's do a dedication. Yen Xiao San Zhang Chu Fan Nao. Yen